You're watching Tag TV. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we have a, a, a very eminent group of uh, panelists here. My name is Mukesh Aghi, and I run U.S. India Strategic Partnership Forum for Washington, D.C. And basically, we focus on trying to strengthen the U.S. India relationship from every aspect from geopolitical, commercial to cultural, and if you go down to education, etc. Uh, we do have a uh, uh, Sumit Gangoli, who is the CEO of GAPS Technology, one of the leading technology firms in, in, in this area itself. I have asked Pradeep Mehta, who's coming all the way from Jaipur, India, who is the founder of Cuts, again, a, a economic think tank based in India, plus in seven other countries itself. And then we have Yogi Sarain, who is basically a, a focus on trying to build a bioenergy uh, entity in India, investing a lot uh, of uh, funds into the energy market for India itself. And then I have uh, Arun Kumar Sharma, uh, who is advisor to USISPF, but earlier he was the chief investment officer uh, at, at uh, IFC itself. And then we have uh, Soumya Sharma, who is the uh, uh, practice leader, Pepper. Hamilton in Washington, D.C. So it's good to have you. Let me just set the stage uh, as to when we look at India, U.S. Uh, you know, from a relationship perspective and also from a business perspective. Uh, the Prime Minister of India in his last budget set up a vision that would like India to be a $5 trillion economy. And today India is around $2.8 trillion economy. And that economy has to grow at least minimum 8% uh, to achieve that objective by 2025. And that means it has to create roughly a million jobs a month itself. And uh, when you look at the $5 trillion objective, it has to attract roughly, we estimated around $800 billion investment. Today, the foreign direct investment coming to India is roughly around $65 billion. And, and more important, uh, India has to start accelerating the export engine also. And when you look at US-India, the bilateral trade was roughly around $142 billion. And we estimate by end of this year, uh, it'll cross $160 billion. So I think uh, there are challenges and opportunities in two countries. And, and two areas where we see a uh, lot of uh, partnership uh, growing between India and the U.S. is one on the direct investment and second is on technology itself. And, and in, in fact, it's fascinating. Uh, uh, Pradeep and I, we just did an event two days ago in Washington, D.C. on innovation between India and the U.S. itself, and we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. But let me, let me basically ask Sumit to give his opening remarks, five minutes, and I'll come to each one of them, and then we'll get into interactive section and come to the audience also. Sumit? Sure. Uh, first of all, Namushka, and uh, good morning. And uh, first of all, uh, before I start, uh, I think Bukesh Ali and US uh, uh, India Strategic Partnership uh, Forum is doing some fascinating work, uh, very much in line with what we're trying today. So I would uh, really invite all of you to go in. Check USISPF. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sumit Ganguly. Uh, I'm the CEO with a company called Gas Technologies. Uh, I'm out of uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And we're doing something fairly disruptive, which was a word that was used uh, last evening. Uh, we're actually building an artificial intelligence led infrastructure management uh, product. It's called Zero Incident Framework, uh, whereby we are creating an aspirational concept of creating an infrastructure in an enterprise which could trend towards zero downtime using artificial intelligence, uh, predictive analytics, uh, remediation through some bots or robots, and monitoring. So that's really what we're trying to do. And uh, India is, of course, very well known in the services area. 
but we are really trying to embark on this whole innovation front. And so it's ZIF.ai, and we are from here, they have technologies. But if you will, uh, frankly, the latitude, Mukesh, uh, <clears throat> I'll quote something that I bathe my intellect in the stupendous cosmogony of the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita. And what Bhagavad Gita provides me actually is puny compared to the modern world and its literature. This was said in Concord, Massachusetts, on the bank of Walden Pond in 1854 by Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson were the foremost philosophers. They were the founders of the transcendental movement out of the US. And he drew a lot of his writing on nonviolence and civil disobedience from Ahimsa because he actually shipped Upanishads, the Gita, from India. In 1893, June 7th, a man gets thrown out of a train in Peter Mertzberg in South Africa. In 1942, he launches his Quit India movement and draws heavily his whole concept of Satyagraha from Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson's nonviolence and his civil disobedience. 1954 to 1968, a lot of things happen in this country which has led to all of us here. Martin Luther King's civil rights movement again drew heavily from Satyagraha. So what I really wanted to highlight that I think what you're doing out here is so relevant and germane and so much a part of the fabric and the currency of ideas from the Vedas to the Upanishads to the civil rights movement to the Satyagraha has really circled the world and has really impacted all of us individually. So thank you so very much to the organizers. Thank you, Mukesh, and a very good morning. Namaskar uh, to all of you. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, as I was telling my co-panelists, I'm the only one from India. In no, we are all from India. <laughs> <laughs> in, the sense, in the sense that I'm still an Indian citizen, so I'm probably the uh, little outlier. By the outline. way, I'm also so, an Indian there you citizen. Go. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> You've got more company than you Oh, that's fantastic. It's, it's good that there are more of us uh, speaking here on this occasion, and thanks to uh, Mukesh's introduction, uh, as I said. I mean, we work closely with USISPF um, and others uh, on promoting a healthier bilateral relation between US and India. We are a 36-year-old uh, organization founded and established in Jaipur in Rajasthan, the pink city. And uh, we've been working on a very large number of economic policy issues uh, across the world, and particularly in Africa, in a very deep manner. Uh, now, in the context of uh, what Shumit said, uh, I, I, as a personal note, I'm inspired to uh, uh, say this, that I've been guided by my <laughs> by the Bhagavad Gita in my work, uh, do your, uh, take action, but leave the uh, fruits upon God, in the sense, don't pine for the fruits. And that has really helped me to, uh, to deal with a lot of <clears throat> odds uh, in life uh, in terms of the kind of work we've been doing. We started off as a consumer protection group, and slowly we have graduated to a public policy uh, think tank and an action tank. So you can well imagine that as a consumer group, we often had to face threats uh, from opposition on uh, various issues. And that said, uh, let me reflect on some of the points which Mukesh made in his opening remarks. In the 1980s and 1990s, I would say 1990s, we had a high growth rate in India, 8.1%. Unfortunately, it was a jobless growth. Uh, it did not, we were not able to create the kind of jobs that we wanted. So at the moment itself, uh, the focus of government of India is, uh, and Prime Minister Modi is very clear on it, in terms of make in India as to how can we buttress our labor intensive sectors? I mean, that is where the jobs are going to come through and that is where we are afraid that technology uh, can lead to disruptions in terms of job losses 
and may, I mean, may lead to uh, job creation in the larger sense when the economy grows, but that still remains a big challenge as we see in today's world. Now, <clears throat> talking about U.S.-India bilateral relations, Mukesh has uh, sp spoken about the data. One issue which I would like to flag here is something which is guiding Trump's trade policy generally across the world is to deal with the trade deficit with the U.S. has uh, in, a, in a big way, and that also includes with India. Though as a percentage of the total trade deficit which the U.S. has with the world, India has a minuscule percentage, but in absolute figures it is quite high. The problem with the trade deficit is uh, what has not been uh, looked at uh, by people is that a lot of imports, which includes uh, uh, any, any country, go into value addition for exports. So you cannot look at imports as solely a consumption uh, input, but also as an intermediate input. Therefore, we did a calculation on the basis of the OECD data, uh, OECD and WTO database, that in 2011, that was the last uh, figure that we had, that as against the trade deficit of $11 billion uh, with the US, uh, the actual, if you deduct the value added portion, that it came down to about $4.8 billion. So the deficit is actually much lower. And this is the same argument which is currently occupying a lot of our minds in India is as we negotiate what is called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which includes China. And China, as it is, is a big trade partner of India and will continue to be so. And the fear that we have is that our trade deficit with China and with other ASEAN countries is still high and is probably going to get worse if we enter into uh, the Regional Comprehensive Partnership Agreement. That could happen because of various other factors. The domestic competitiveness in India is very bad. The transaction cost itself, according to various estimates, range between 10 to 17 percent disadvantage in terms of cost of finance, cost of electricity, cost of uh, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera logistics particularly. So that is a major agenda which I think, Mukesh, uh, would be important for, uh, for us as, as, uh, as pressure groups or as, is to, completely, to, com continue to, to continue to tell our governments, I use the word governments because uh, we are a quasi-federal country, and each of the states has its own uh, uh, ways how to deal with the same, uh, same issue. I mean, you'd be surprised. One of our research showed that in land acquisition, we looked at the same law being applied in five different provinces in a different way. It depends on what kind of practices which uh, emanate there. But the, but the point is that the big challenge is that it is not only the top-down policies that we have to work with in terms of government of India in order to improve competitiveness, but also to and in that uh, context, uh, the roundtable that we had, as Mukesh spoke about two days ago at, with the US ISPF on innovation, throws up a lot of ideas as to how we can improve upon. I'll give you a simple example, which came up, which I did not know, uh, is that we are now a big defense partner with the US, something like $18 billion was last year's uh, turnover. And as a policy, many countries adopt that. There is an offset policy. The 30% of the value of the uh, uh, goods that you sell or services that you sell have to be invested, reinvested into some other defense sector. That is the rule that we follow in India. It was pointed out in that round table uh, that many other countries allow that 30% offset to be used in sectors which are not necessarily defense sector. For example, and one thing which came up very clearly was that how can we improve our R&D ecosystem in India, which is quite poor, uh, in the sense that public R&D system, there are uh, private companies, uh, private sector companies, including a lot of American companies which are doing a lot of R&D, including uh, doing a lot of innovation. But in terms of public space, uh, it is not happening in the way it is. So the, it is, I mean, one kind of possible reform that we can look at is how can we change the defense offset policy in India, which will allow uh, that money to not go waste. I mean, people, companies are not able to invest uh, that, uh, in any other similar sector. Uh, that said, <coughs> uh, let me conclude here in terms of uh, what uh, we, India and U.S. have also jointly agreed to have a target of $500 billion trade by 2025. 
And it's a difficult target, but then you set targets to try and do better than what you are doing now. At the moment, it is $140 billion. Now, in that, there are a lot of trade irritants. There are a lot of irritants which we are seeing between US and India. And US, uh, unfortunately, looks at uh, trade as a, as a, as a, uh, as a zero-sum game. It doesn't look at it comprehensive, and constant uh, refrain has been made that you have to look at it in a comprehensive manner. What are the strategic relations that we have instead of just looking at trade? But uh, I think all of you are Americans, as you would know, what kind of thinking dominates the policy here. It's fairly mercantile, and therefore uh, we continue. There is, uh, there are a lot of trade irritants at the moment. At the moment, like uh, on uh, medical devices, uh, we. We brought in a price cap because the Indian public cannot afford to pay such high prices. Uh, that is a major irritant. For example, uh, the U.S. exporters don't want that to happen. Uh, there is some movement uh, in order to, and we have also raised our tariffs uh, without any sense uh, on many other goods which the U.S. finds difficult. And what we are telling the government of India is that you look, don't don't become protectionist. The trouble is that globally everybody is becoming protectionist. Ever since the US-China trade, uh, US -China trade war has taken place, the global economy is slowing down. And that is not only affecting us, but including US. The latest uh, data which shows in the US is about 1.9% growth is probably the lowest in the recent past. And that is, again, a cause of concern. So you can well imagine in India it has come down to about 5%. And even that 5% figure is uh, sometimes debated whether it is real or, or, or inflated. We don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but having said that, the message that I would like to convey here is that uh, the U.S.-India relations, particularly in terms of strategic areas, are very critical in the context of the Indo-Pacific context. Uh, we have a quad, uh, India, U.S., Australia, and Japan, which is working on several things together at a very slow pace. It could be improved. Uh, but provided the atmosphere is much more, uh, much more congenial and much more cooperative. Thank, Thank you. Thank uh, you, Yogi. And let's just limit to five minutes so we can uh, get into interaction session, Definitely. please. Thanks. Thank you, Mukesh. And uh, sorry for voting. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with the Hindu American Saiga. And uh, first time I'm here, we have worked with Mukesh uh, last few years. Tremendous job they are doing felicitating uh, India-U.S. cooperation in a more positive manner. Uh, my name is Yogi Sarin. Uh, I came to America 44 years ago, uh, chemical engineer by profession, set up three companies here, uh, have engineering staff of over 400 people. Uh, we work uh, initially in petroleum sector, and then we decided after Climate awareness was there, 2005, Kyoto Protocol, that the world has to shift away from decarbonizing. They, they cannot afford to play with the nature, God-given nature, uh, and go back to, to basics, to clean energy. So that's where India, instead of follower, being a follower, can be a leader. India has such a tremendous climate uh, it has agriculture base. All the economies of the world, if you see, uh, like even like U.S., for example, in 15 years, they have set up so much of bio-related, biofuel-related industry that one day they hope to replace petroleum. Of course, uh, Brazil has done that. So uh, I, I got settled in U.S., uh, got educated here, raised my children here. They're all working, but our focus is shifted back to India to make a paradigm shift in India's focus. India cannot do the same things uh, and expect different results. They have to shift. Most of the India lives in rural, you know, in uh, rural areas. 70, 80 percent is still agriculture base. Unless we live, uplift the villages of India, and that you can only do it not by putting 100 billion dollar or 7 lakh crore rupees in petroleum sector today, which they announced, Mrs. Sitaraman, other day in New York, you cannot do that. That money should go to agriculture, to farmers, 
who can then grow the biomass, who can grow the, the food, the agriculture, not for just feeding, but also to convert to industry. A molecule of sugar or, 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 or you know, starch can do the same thing a crude oil can do. And we have proven that worldwide. We are working in several countries. So my suggestion is India, US should focus more on agriculture growth, industrial growth on that, scientific advancement. You know, they don't allow GMO crops in India. Okay, it's debatable. But if it is only used for fuel purposes, it shouldn't matter. So there is a big trade opportunity with US where India can grow and create millions of jobs. From 2.2 to 5 trillion, 8% growth you cannot achieve by putting more petroleum plants or nuclear plants. One nuclear plant takes $10 billion, <coughs> creates 500 megawatt of power. No, nobody knows what to do with the wasted fuel. That money, if you put in agriculture, you can create millions of jobs in agriculture. So that's where Prime Minister Modi, I mean, we had some discussions with the government. They have to focus total shift from decarbonized economy. Just one more second. I mean, uh, two weeks ago, I was in a Princeton conference, and in Princeton University, international scientists predicted that by 2040, city of Calcutta and city of Mumbai will be underwater. So we have to wake up, harness as God-given solar energy, wind energy, and bioenergy, and take the country forward, be a leader, and not just a follower. We no, not, not a second fiddle. Thank you. Thank you, Yogi. Uh, you know, before I have uh, Arun speak up, the couple of stats I have to mention. India imports 83% of its energy, spending roughly $120 billion a year itself. And the energy relationship with the U.S. is growing. Uh, three years ago, India imported zero energy from the U.S. 2017, it was importing roughly 32,000 barrels of oil every day. Last year, it has crossed to 140,000 barrels a day itself, and we expect this year to go over 250,000 barrels a day from the U.S. So I think the energy partnership between U India and U.S. Is, is growing, but I think what we have to explore is the alternative energy, and we'll come back to that. Arun, India needs investment. Talk about that. Sure. Thank you. So uh, thanks again, uh, Mukesh, for, uh, for the invitation. Uh, so uh, my name is Arun Sharma. I just uh, moved to start my own advisory practice uh, called Grove Pike Associates after 28 years at the World Bank's private sector arm, the International Finance Corporation, where it was a tremendous honor to work in 50 countries uh, around the world for all these doing all kinds of different things, uh, but largely in the intervening through the financial sector. Today, my practice focuses only on two things. One is on fintech, and the other is on sustainable finance, which, uh, as the discussion has already shown, are central to everybody's mind. And uh, one of the reasons I've chosen that is that I had the opportunity to lead some of our investments in these spaces uh, in, uh, at the IF. You know, we have been a pioneer in this kind of thing for the last 50 years. And uh, so when I decided to move, what I find most gratifying is a lot of the world wants to be IFC. Everybody wants to do good, to do good for the planet and do it through the private sector and do it on a sustainable basis. So as and one of the things, therefore, I'm doing is to continue some of the work that uh, I started in these areas, including uh, you know, doing the first green bond for the IFC, which is the first green bond in emerging markets in 2015, which is now become an industry by itself. And uh, also we set up the first green bank uh, in the private sector. I'm very proud to say that it was in India. Uh, there's no other developed country that has set up a private sector green bank. There are lots of state-owned green banks, including in the US. And the ones in the UK have was a state-owned, but it's been privatized. But the only green, private sector green bank in the world to finance the fight against climate change is in India. It's a company that's a joint venture between the IFC and Tata. The group called, it's called Tata Clean Tech Capital, and we financed over a billion dollars worth of uh, solar <coughs> energy and other forms of renewable energy, and we are expanding into all kinds of uh, climate change financing projects, including uh, the Namami Gange projects for cleanup of Ganga, lots of other things. 
And uh, just in terms of the US-India partnership, I just, my role was at the IFC to create joint ventures uh, to bring US corporations to India in, uh, in projects that would make a transformative impact for the country. Uh, so, and this is a long tradition for the IFC. We picked up the US mortgage system to create HDFC in India in 1978, way back, well before I joined. Uh, and so that's been the tradition. But what have the, uh, you know, and the, now the, but the opportunity to do so and the need to do so is tremendous. And I think one of the most important roles, the US IPF, and I think all of us in this room who have one foot in each of these, both these wonderful countries, can do is to see what we can learn from the US. See, the most important thing the US-India Partnership Forum can do, and all of us can do, is to really be a little humble and try to understand why is the US as vibrant, as efficient, as desirous or desirable as a country to migrate, where the world, including all of us sitting, most of us sitting in this room, uh, find it, uh, I would say, worthwhile to move from our home country, love, beloved home country, to come here and live. There's, there's a reason for it. And there are not only one, multiple reasons for it. And I think to understand those reasons and how we can benefit from that, I think is fundamental to our mission. Right. And that's really part of my mission as an advisor to the USIPF to see what we can do. And we can talk more in the panel. There are lots of things we can do. I think India has, starting with the bedrock of our philosophy, uh, of our traditions, uh, of our capabilities, the absolutely strongest basis for moving forward in today's world, because the things that are fundamental to our culture are, is, are what are being discovered today. The focus on inclusiveness, the focus on climate, the focus on peace, the focus on globalization, the focus on understanding. If you look at each and any one of these positive strands, you find a direct correlation in the teachings of the Gita, the teachings of the Upanishads, the teachings even of the Puranas. And I don't even want to go into Mahabharata and Ramayana, which are very subtle, very nuanced, permanent lessons um, in human relationships, in basically the interactions of humanity. But so we have everything we need. But what is it that we are not able to use any of that, and we are not even able to use the lessons that are sitting right before our eyes in the country we live in to make the transformation our country so desperately needs after 70 years of independence is something that should be, I think, fundamental to our focus, including, because without that, I don't think we will be able to make what I call a delta shift. Yes, we will continue to get increasing investment. We will continue to get growth. We will continue to get improved prosperity. But how do you make that transitional shift, that quantum leap that we as a country need? And time is really running out. I agree with the comments made earlier. We have very little time left in terms of the, you know, I was never a believer in Malthus till these days. You know, I always felt that, you know, somehow science and technology and human ingenuity will overcome the exponential population growth. I'm sometimes now beginning to doubt that a little bit. When you hear figures like, the oil import figure on the one side, the shortage of water in Chennai on the other, for example, the decline in the water table in Haryana on the third. These are fundamental things that can hit us very quickly, very hard. So, that, so time is really short. So I think it's really time to think collectively as a group how we can make the transformational shift. So I'll stop here and we can talk about these. Thank things. you, Arun. Uh, I'm going to ask Soumya to give her opening remarks. Yeah. Well, thank you, and good morning, everybody. I'm Soumya Sharma. I'm an attorney at uh, the law firm of Pepper Hamilton. Pepper is a national US law firm. It has its offices pretty much in every state. Um, we are headquartered in Philadelphia, and I'm based out of their New York office. I practice predominantly mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, strategic alliances, carve-outs, and the like. And uh, what I find very fascinating about my practices and my views and my observations will be strictly limited to investments between these two countries, because that's what I see on a pretty much daily basis. Um, I was born in Mumbai, and uh, by the time 
I was in my senior year of high school. I had changed close to 12 schools. Uh, my father was in the Indian Army. He retired Major General. And so I ended up being in certain areas and places that no one even in India has heard of. I've been to schools that no one's heard of. But what is interesting is that most of my classmates are doing pretty well. And we're all connected through WhatsApp. We have groups. And you know, the hyper-connectivity has got me still very entrenched into the roots of the country. Um, I'm also very well acquainted with the culture of these various parts. You know, India is uh, very different. In fact, uh, you know, there, there's so many differences when you travel from Bengal to Kashmir to uh, Punjab to Haryana. And it is those little quirks, even when we do business with some of the people that hail out of these countries, you can see certain principles they bring to the table that are actually originating in some part from the culture that's brought about by these different states. Um, a few observations on the current state of the Indian economy. Uh, from my side, when I was, I, I'm, I'm actually qualified to practice both in India and the United States. I worked with a premier law firm in India for three years before I moved to the States. And uh, when I was working in India, most of my deals were foreign direct investments, predominantly from the United States. So we advised US investors, and I was frustrated because they were doing global deals, and I was just a discreet. You know, I was handling a discrete portion, which was India. And I wanted to be able to drive these global deals. And I also felt that very soon, Indians would be in that position too. And what is great and very rewarding is that today I actually advise Indian conglomerates as they invest in the United States and they undergo their international carve outs. And I'm happy that I'm able to lead those deals. Very recently, I think in uh, earlier this year, we had uh, UPL invest about $4 billion in the United States. So, you know, to see action on both sides has been very, very interesting and extremely rewarding as far as I'm concerned. Um, I expect the US-India commercial relationship to grow by leaps and bounds. And as uh, Mukesh uh, pointed out, if the goal is to move the GDP from wherever it's standing, I believe 2.9 trillion to 5 trillion, one of the biggest factors is massive capex. And um, India has the need, US has the resources. And uh, just looking at our infrastructure demands, I mean, I was looking at the number of contracts that were uh, auctioned off by the railway sector. It's mind boggling. So I have no doubt that this relationship is here to stay. But I also think that uh, India has made some pretty massive strides in that regard. For example, our uh, numbers and uh, ease of doing business. You know, I, I think uh, going up by 23 points has been a feat in itself. Although there are some areas which we can talk about, for example, enforcement of contract, I think we're still at, what, 163. So the good part is we know where we need to improve. And uh, hopefully that's where we're going to be focusing on as we go about achieving our ambitious goals. Um, as far as the role of India in the world is concerned, I think it's only begun to scratch its surface. What is fascinating is when I look at the demographics, and I think one of the studies is 75% of our population is below 25. And as I'm you know, interacting with the millennials, I think they're a different breed. They're managing to change mindsets in a way I'd never thought of before during my time. And by the way, I'm a cusp between Gen X and millennials, so I kind of understand both. But in my time, you know, when somebody got a Bentley, it was considered cool. Today, somebody goes vegan, and it's considered cool. And, and I think that mindset change, and this is just a digression, but that mindset change is also resulting in, you know, look at the unicorns we have. So the Oyo Hotel. Uh, I think the founder is 25 years old or 23. Um, you know, it's more than what $10 billion in capitalization. These guys are not looking at, you know, I'm going to replicate this 
technology that has worked in the US and make a quick money out of it. They are in it to make it big. And that sort of mindset change, I think, is going to result in India actually becoming a pretty significant player in the global market. So those are my two cents. Thank you, Swamiya. <laughs> uh, I have a, a few questions, then I'll come to the audience. So please write your questions itself. And I'm going to ask rapid fire questions and <laughs> rapid fire answers here. Uh, Swamiya, to you first. You know, US has roughly around $17 trillion capital kind of floating looking for investment. And whereas India needs desperately, as I mentioned earlier, $800 billion investment in the next five years itself. What is one thing or two things India needs to do to attract that capital? I think from where I sit, uh, we've already taken giant strides in liberalizing the foreign direct investment policy. I think two areas where I think further progress could be made is Brownfield Pharma. I think right now it is uh, restricted to 74 under automatic and 100 uh, with approval. And if we can sort of synchronize it as how we did for the single brand retail, where it is automatic, but you have certain conditionalities. So, you know, do not uh, compromise national interests when it comes to making sure there's adequate supply of life-saving drugs. Or, uh, you know, we have our generic market that's uh, robust. But I think that could be one area. The second area I think we could think about is civil aviation. Uh, you know, the recent bankruptcy of JET and the intent to nationalize, or oh, sorry, privatize Air India. I think one area could be, you know, making those uh, concessions for foreign airlines and not be so hard stopped about, you know, you cannot invest more than 49%. Um, I think enforcement of contract, uh, I think that's another area we should be thinking very, very closely. If you're talking about $800 billion in investment, we're looking at infrastructure. And I think the current state of infrastructure is that, uh, uh, you know, government needs to do a better job declogging the pipelines of infrastructure developers so they don't default on their loans. So I think contract enforcement, even within the government level, needs to be cleaned up. And, you know, sanctity of contract should be respected in those uh, areas. And I think those three areas to me, it's turned to be somewhat critical if you're looking at immediate investments. Thank you. So, let me come to you from a, a technology perspective. You know, the, uh, the corridor uh, is very, very strong between India and the U.S. and technology. If you look at 50% of the IP or patents being generated in India belong to U.S. companies. And, and you are building an AI platform. And when we look at the challenges India has, not only just from job creation, economics, environment, water, how can you leverage technology uh, to overcome the, those issues itself? <clears throat> um, let's get some levity in the room a little bit. <clears throat> For the longest time when Aishwarya Rai and Priyanka Chopra were winning a lot of beauty contests and information technology was doing very well, uh, they felt that the two areas where government intervention was low, IT and beauty, India was doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think over the years, uh, technology has clearly been the bedrock of Indian growth. Uh, almost 177 billion is the total IT uh, GDP from India. Uh, 136 million, billion of that comes to the US. Uh, between U.S. and U.K., 80% of uh, Indian IT export uh, happens to these two countries. Uh, why I'm saying all this is for the last 20, 25 years, and you've, of course, led very successful technology companies, uh, it's not a pipe dream. India clearly is a leader in the IT services area. Uh, there are a whole host of issues. But life is also about compartmentalizing. Uh, we do have the water table in Haryana being a problem. Uh, the Madras issue is more hype. I go to Madras every couple of, year, um, couple of months, or actually every month. Uh, 
it's more a water mafia issue than a natural water table issue. So that could be changed. So, so that's one aspect to it. Now talking about technology, uh, there is this whole 75 at India, the whole Niti Aayog report. Uh, and I'll talk in two phases, one on a micro level, what we are doing or companies of our ilk are doing, and on a macro level. On a macro level, you have the Atal Innovation Center, uh, almost 1,100 centers uh, have been built by the government, and that's kind of promoting innovation. Uh, there's significant amount of work being done in the R&D area. Uh, from 2014 to around 2018, uh, the R&D investment has gone up by around 4%, I mean, four times. India, and to answer your question, Ms. Mehta, uh, Brazil is around 1.3% of GDP. China is around 2% of the GDP. Israel is almost 4% of the GDP in terms of research and development. Mm -hmm. India is at 1.3%, but the Prime Minister's office is actually focusing extensively on the R&D part of it. And what's really happening now, there's a whole host of relationship to promote innovation and research through the private institutions. Uh, we, for one, uh, we are again based out of Chennai, and I'm out of Princeton, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. But we have a very strong relationship with IIT Madras. Uh, believe you me, the AI that we are building, and Mukesh knows it, is state of the art. Uh, there's a concept called reinforced learning. And the whole algorithm was worked in partnership with IIT Madras. Uh, the professor uh, is a PhD from MIT, and they've actually built a research and development center called the Robert Bosch Innovation Center. And we're working with them. And now we're building this enterprise AI product in collaboration and partnership with them. So a whole host of companies are doing some extensive amount of work. And I think the belief system, uh, drawing from what India has been over the years, is very strong and the chutzpah is high. So I'm actually very, very bullish on where the software product and the AI and the innovation centers that's going to come out of India. Thank you. Uh, Pradeep. Uh India's economy last quarter grew by 5%. And there's a lot of noise that the economy is slowed down, gloom and doom. And we just saw yesterday US economy grew by 1.9%. Um, what's your thinking on India's economy? Is this uh, gloom and doom, or is it you see much more higher perspective in the short term? Well. <clears throat> I mean, like many, many of us, we believe in the short term is going to be bad. <clears throat> For the simple reason that the economic management uh, at the highest level is uh, very uh, demanding. I mean, you need to do much more. And that is lacking uh, in that sense that, uh, you know, the ad hoc measures being announced. For example, finance minister announced uh, a new corporate tax rate in order to bring it down. Now, that, these kind of things would have only an impact in the long term. It will never have an impact in the short term. What is important in India at the moment is, uh, <clears throat> is how we can we boost the consumption expenditure, which means can the government take a step, which I think they are contemplating, is to reduce the income tax of the middle class uh, to a lower level so that they have more money in their hands uh, in order to spend. Uh, we just saw. In terms of gloom and doom, what really hit the Indian uh, scene was the terrible shape the automobile sector was in. Nearly 40% down in its sales, 250,000 jobs gone. Now, problem is many of these things, some of, some of the automobile companies are still doing well, surprisingly, uh, or at least some of the segments, some of the particular size of cars are doing well, but in the overall there was a doom. And, uh, doom. What happens is that often these kind of news make the headlines and send out a very negative signal uh, across the economy. And so, you know, even consumers, we saw in last Diwali itself, the data which has come out that the purchases of people in gold or whatever, what is the traditional way, had come down substantially about 18% from the same uh, data last year at the same time. So you can imagine, I mean, some of it is coming out, you know, through kind of a uh, <clears throat> a mental backlash, 
uh, look, it's, uh, it, it, let us be cautious. The real estate sector in India is still in a bad shape uh, after demonetization and the introduction of the uh, real estate regulatory agency. The, I mean, the real estate regulatory uh, law is a very good law, uh, but it has come in at a time when the economy was going down and the sense that so a lot of builders are left with unsold. Uh, uh, and there's a huge amount of uh, real estate, which I would you know, encourage anybody from uh, here to invest in because this is the right time to invest. And maybe in five years' time, you'll find that you know, prices have gone up. Uh, but any wise man always invests in depression and then makes money in, you know, and the boom time returns. So real estate is, uh, in fact... But Amazon and Flipkart managed to sell 2.5 billion in Diwali. So how do you... Consumer goods. That, that, you, know, you do come across these paradoxes. We, we do come and now, they were able to sell because of very aggressive marketing and very low pricing. So that is how people went in for that. It is not that. I mean, if you remember Ravi Shankar Prashad, our uh, <coughs> information broadcasting minister, in the last, the Friday of the Diwali week, uh, three movies were released and they, they clocked 140 crore rupees in the box office. So he said, where is the, <laughs> where is the, where is the dump? I mean, these are not, these are not, these are not good uh, indicators in terms of, you know, to show the overall economy. Overall so, economy. so you're saying that short term we have challenges, short term we have but long term challenges. is a good, good prospect itself. Yes. So, okay. I mean, you see, the fundamentals yeah. remain strong, uh, Mukesh. Okay. Yogi, uh, you come from the energy sector, alternative energy, and if you look at uh, seven out of ten cities in India are the most polluted in the world. Right. And uh, the challenge on the alternative energies are quite a few. What would you, your recommendation would be to government of India looking at partnership with the U.S. from alternative energy perspective? So there are a couple of things, uh, as you mentioned, Mukesh. World Health Organization published a report 15 out of 20 most polluted cities are in India. In Delhi, they had to shut, the, shut their schools last week because of pollution. Thank you. Our children in India are losing their lung capacity. India cannot prosper by any, you know, good to have good, good IT sector, good transport sector, good cars, more consumption. But if the population is becoming sicker, we are losing the demographic potential of the country. We are not harnessing it. So the India, for example, Sumit mentioned about, I think water crisis is real in India. It's not a mafia thing. We don't have water available under the table. But Saudi Arabia did. I lived in the Middle East. They got so desalination of the... India has so much water all around from Calcutta to South to the Raj... To, to Gujarat, we have all over the water, Indian Ocean is there. All we need is a bunch of desalination plants running on solar power, which God has given us, or wind energy, which, which these cities have it, and desalinate the water. And we are bringing trucks and trucks and polluting. Yes, so that's why we're talking about the mafia, the water mafia. It's is not a mafia, it's an issue, it's a supply issue. And coming back to Pradeep's point, consumption should be the right consumption. Buying more, we don't need more cars in India, honestly speaking. When I came from India, you could drink water from a tap anywhere. Today, I don't know how many cities in India you can drink tap water. You, you, can't. you cannot. You can't. Why? A country which cannot provide good water and breathe air, you know, you can do pranayam, you can do any breathing exercises, but the ministers live in air-conditioned bungalows. They don't care about it, some of them. Prime Minister does. So the message has to go out that India has to shift. We have to go back to our ancient philosophy, invest in the agriculture sector, and U.S. can play a very vital role in that. U.S. has done, in last 15 years, we are producing in U.S., and I'm involved closely, 50 million tons, 15 billion barrels of biofuels, which can supply India's demand for two years. No, no, zero petroleum. So India has to learn from U.S., bring the technology to India. Now they, have, they said, no, we won't bring U.S. ethanol, but we'll bring Middle East oil. Why? We will br not bring U.S. corn to India. 
the farmers are cannot get rich by just growing wheat and and depend on the weather every year they are committing suicide so you have to bring new technology to agriculture work with us who has shown to the world that how can you transform biofuels into a good you don't you don't need petroleum decarbonize the whole country but i don't think us is a great example of us is a great example energy. people some of this us is a great example because they have oil but the consumption is so large here so they have to go to energy efficiency which you know like electric let, let me uh, move yeah. on to uh, audience questions because i have <laughs> limited time here and i just want to make sure we stick to the schedule of arun uh, a question raised for you basically saying that you said that we ran away from india have come to the us and basically how do we basically enhance this culture or otherwise we'll have to run from here back to india <laughs> okay it's it's a very good question actually it's related to a question a lot of people ask me and i work for 25 years in development in 50 odd countries and people always ask me what's the what makes the difference between a developed and a developing country and what what why is why are certain countries for all these years you know they are why are they underdeveloped by some countries what's the, what's the, you know you could you could write many books and many books are written every day so you go to harvard library or princeton library books are full libraries are full of books about that but if you ask me in one sentence it may be not so politically correct answer but unfortunately it's the true answer that is that's what i've learned the difference between a developed and a developing country and relates to the us india difference as well is the following the willingness and the ability of the population and I include ministers down to the peon to work in the collective interest as opposed to individual interest makes that is the only one factor that drives all the changes all the differences between the state of one country versus another that state or that willingness has and the ability and willingness to execute on that basis varies across countries and i can challenge anybody to make a correlation to see any country you take chile you take portugal you take thailand you take malaysia you take indonesia you take india you take us you take switzerland you take france you take norway on every you take any metric you want you will find that societies where the conscience of the people the mindset of the people is driven by the broader social interest whether it is to your neighborhood whether it is to your condo society whether it is to your village whether it is to your city your state whether your country as long as that is superseding your individual interest to the extent it deviates or diverges that is fundamental to anything so like you you, know, you can take any example you want so in some of these things one of the things about the us you know people said look you know this administration has come you know we are in trouble no we are not for heaven's sake you may have your political views about this administration but are people cutting down trees just because mr trump pulled out of the you know paris accord is somebody are people throwing trash in the streets in the us because we pulled out of the climate accords our national parks of this country being disrupted our people in any way less responsible when trekking the grand canyon in throwing the trash in the trash can we are in the we in india are in the paris accord we are leading the world in many many renewable energy initiatives but are people throwing trash in trash cans in our cities so that's the core issue thank you uh, i'm going to address uh The next uh, question to both Sumit and Soumya. How Hindu business leaders can help and support young entrepreneurs to start business based on Hindu values, dharma as sustaining principle? Soumya, should you go first? Soumya? Soumya, I think you should go first. I'll do that. I'll do that. No, no, I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> uh, pardon me if I am not going to pronounce it right, but karmanya vahadika rastu, right? a uh, mafil issue chadanana uh i think one thing that i have learned in the last 30 years in america and which i think is the core to any innovation or entrepreneurship is fearlessness and i think many of us from india uh, tend to come from the middle class upper middle class background 
And our parents have given us some guardrails. And they've done that with best of intentions. Uh, because classic Maslow's need hierarchy, where we are from, it was extremely important that we take care of our physiological needs. And then we can look elsewhere. But I think the key to entrepreneurship is a little bit of fearlessness. And culture plays a key role in that. Uh, we talked about innovation again. Uh, that has a lot to do with it as well. Uh, again, if I may, and just to kind of infuse some interest, Arun, that was a causality, uh, which is, do successful countries foster a sense of altruism and service, or countries which have intrinsic altruistic behavior succeed? We can talk about that. But I think the important thing for all of us, and I still don't have an answer because I have a 22-year-old son, and for him, I'm chopped liver. Uh, so anything that I say really doesn't matter. So at least you're, I have a captive audience here. Uh, but the point is, I think what I keep talking to people that uh, there is some sense of innovation and fearlessness will come from a society which has that net. Uh, a lot of the uh, Nordic countries do exceptionally well uh, with a lot of newer technologies, largely because one end they have almost 55, 60% taxes, but the social net is so strong that people are able to kind of fructify and look for self-actualization, be it in technology, be it in whatever they're trying to do, or as simple as trekking. And I think that is going to come but the culture, and there again, I had a difference of point of view with the keynote speaker yesterday, uh, where he differentiated uh, business leaders with Hindu, promoting actual Hinduism. I believe being an anchor or a testament to Hinduism per se, which is humility, uh, which is about curiosity, uh, which is about peace, and doing and creating a company which is long-term for a purpose and being significant and leaving a legacy behind, I think those are a lot that we can draw from our Hindu heritage and evolve into something substantial. Thank you. Somia? Um, uh, I, I think uh, very well said, uh, Somit. Uh, the way I think about business leaders and as you tied it back to dharma and Hindu philosophy, I have, uh, uh, you know, I've been born into a Hindu family, and Hindu family from Haryana, which is quite a combination. Um, uh, right, I mean, for those who don't know Haryana, you can equate it to Texas. These are pretty gritty people, and they don't care about taking risks. Uh, that's a nice way of putting it. Um, and so when I think about, you know, business leaders and I see most of the immigrant population from India that comes into the United States somewhat hesitant to take risks. And I'm talking about sectors such as finance, investment banking. Um, and, and I think part of it is perhaps economic or uh, financial insecurity. And uh, what I have found very fascinating, because I do observe this, and, and I come from you know, a family that is very strong together, like literally my father's sister is very open to saying, oh, just quit, you know, if, if this doesn't work for you, just say I'm done. And <laughs> I was like, that's not how it's done. <laughs> you know, you have to fight. And I draw a lot of inspiration from Bhagavad Gita. I actually believe in karma. So, uh, you know, just sort of detach from the results but to do good work, I think, has really helped me in good stead. Now, I don't deploy the strategy with my clients because I want them to get good results, <laughs> don't get me wrong. But when it comes to my own personal self, I think Hinduism and the concept of uh, you know, karma really provides that sort of strength. Because if you start worrying about what the results are going to be, you'd never be able to do anything. So I think grit, strength, you know, Hindu families are very well knit. They're very strong, very hierarchical. You know, um, they provide that connection, but they also provide that support. And my family has always been very tolerant, very open. 
Um, and, um, and I think that's what most of Hindu families are. So, um, yeah, I derive these inspirations from scriptures, and they have worked very well for me. I'm sure Hindu business leaders can help the future generation of Hindus as in draw these inspirations and sort of ask them to take more risks. It's not, uh, you know, you, you can do pretty well with that. <laughs> Thank you, Sobia. Uh, I, am I have a lot of questions, but I'm also conscious of the time. Uh, so I'm going to go around and give you two minutes each as a wrap-up. And my question to you, and this is in regards to, uh, we were at the Howdy Modi event in Houston, and we had around 50,000 plus people inside and another 5,000 people outside, Indian Americans. And for the first time, you could see uh, the power of Indian diaspora. But more important to me was, for the first time I saw President Trump sitting for 50 minutes listening to Prime Minister speaking in Hindi. And uh, it shows basically the rise of India, the power of Indian diaspora together itself. So the question I have to the panel is, what can the diaspora do, or what kind of role they can play to enhance this relationship? It doesn't just have to be commercial. Uh, it can be cultural. It can be from a literature perspective. You come from Jaipur. You have a literature festival coming through. What would be your thinking when you look forward 10 years from now itself? I'll start with you, Sumit. OK. Again, uh, a little bit of a contrapoint especially since we are here uh, celebrating our Hindutva. Uh, <clears throat> I think very often we run the risk of being very myopic in our zeal to celebrate our exceptionalism as Hindus. Uh, we may, if you don't mind my word, in a very, in a very sophisticated way, ghettoize it. We shall try and interact with each other, even if we have, as Arun suggested, come all this way. If we to just interact with amongst ourselves and create a mutual admiration society, uh, I think there is a lot of detriment to that. Uh, let's be honest. This has been clearly the beacon on the hill, America, that is. Uh, we've been blessed and fortunate to come here. And we come from a culture which has great heritage. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be ambassadors of that and kind of permeate that and do through osmosis, meet people and talk about it. The intent is not to be the evangelist and kind of spit brimstone and fire from the bully pulpit of Hinduism. But I think we can be living examples of it. I think in today's world, since being uh, being brusque and rude is becoming so common. I think let's again hark back to humility, uh, propriety, uh, respect for elders. And if I may, uh, you'll allow me, even in economics, uh, you had the Gandhian philosophy, but we don't often talk about Sarvarkar or Dindayal Upadhyay, uh, where they actually talked about there's a third way. There was capitalism, there was communism, but I think ethics, and ethics in terms of running a business, running a company, uh, dealing with ourselves is extremely important, virtue. And I think those are something that we can uh, perpetually internalize. But again, most important, we need to reach out and spread the word and engage with people of local folks here as against just kind of creating a group within ourselves. Thank you, Pradeep. I very interesting observations being made by my co-panelists, which sort of provoke me to share my own understanding about Hinduism. Hinduism is not a religion. Let's understand that very clearly. It's a way of life. It's a philosophy. And the only religion, if at all we call it a religion, uh, we have 300 million gods and goddesses. Which other religion has so many gods and goddesses? None. Hinduism can also absorb an atheist and agnostic and a believer, and orthodox, non-orthodox. In fact, various branches of Hinduism, the way they are practiced, Sanatana Dharma, 
or Arya Samaj, etc., have been kind of a revolt against the orthodoxy in certain parts of Hindu society. Certain parts, let me say that. Now, if you look at our DNA of 10,000 years, we are basically liberal and eclectic. And that is something which we must continue to retain in order to, right. to live as a good human being on the earth, including to transfer that knowledge or understanding uh, the question is Mukesh asked uh, in terms of uh, what is it that you can contribute to the American society. The American society, by and large, is very ignorant about India. That's my own understanding about uh, you know visiting U.S. for many many years. Many people, I mean, find maybe a handful of educated uh, people lot uh, are aware of what India is, but many of them even think that you know. I mean, I remember staying at an American's home, and the child asked me an innocent question. Do you have a government? I don't blame her because, you know, the kind of education she's being given about India is that, you know, India is some kind of, you know, that rope trick, <laughs> living in some kind of, uh, and we have to uh, understand that. Now, just, uh, Arun, uh, one point I would like to, uh, my own work in terms of developing uh, development and developing countries and developed countries. Long ago, we've been running a campaign against uh, the imposition of labor standards and trade agreements. Now, we have done a lot of research on child labor in India, which is there as uh, something which is impossible to eradicate for the simple reason, poverty. Unless development has happened, you will not find a, a, a poor man not sending his children to work. Secondly, that is also a reason for population explosion, because the poor man is, or poor women are not confident as to how many children will survive. So therefore they have, you know, this kind of a vicious cycle. And in that context, uh, <coughs> the same thing applies to many other countries in the world. So when you look Pradeep, at the- Pradeep, let me just jump in. They were waving the flag at me. Oh, uh, let, let me conclude, what, yeah, here. conclude and, here. You know, I mean, one has to understand the development Paradox, uh, which exists in many developing countries. Lawrence Summers, when he was at the World Bank, sends a, a memo around that look, uh, you know, all the all the all the <clears throat> dirt that we produce in the U.S. can be shipped to a poor African country because they can afford to store it. I mean, these are the kind of things which we should be aware about. Thank, Thank you, Pradeep. One one minute each. Just wrap it up, yeah. So I think as the diaspora, uh, we can play a very vital role in bridging the cultural and business gap with India. But U.S. has to see its benefit in India, and India has to see the benefit in U.S. And I think the sectors of agriculture, defense, and industry, uh, right now with China uh, de delusionment in U.S., India has a great opportunity, but it has to clean its act together quickly and move on with the, the industry. U.S. is still is a, by and large, Midwest is all agriculture and all. Those are the areas India should focus, and not automobiles, not other areas, and, and go forward. Both sides benefit. That will bridge the gap. Thank you, Arun. Yeah, so I agree with the, you know the outreach point made by Sumit, and I just add one 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 little, uh, not not entirely frivolous point that we should remind our our American friends and neighbors that uh, the reason they have America is that Christmas Columbus was looking for India, <laughs> <laughs> which is absolutely true. Uh, without without. Uh, so I think it there is a been better off without the syphilis. Yes, <laughs> but still they wouldn't have had this country if uh, Mr. Columbus wasn't looking for us. Well, Thank you, there. Somia. Um, yeah, just two points, and I think uh, that came out from that uh, Howdy Modi summit that I attended, and I thought the Prime Minister made two very interesting points. Sound very innocuous, but tied right into how the people-to-people -people connect really matters, and can propel this partnership. I think one was he requested all the NRIs to teach their children their mother tongue. And that's because obviously they're American citizens and they're born here. But if you were to get a connection to a country like India where you just connect naturally and are able to speak the language, just the, the, the business you can do between the two countries is phenomenal. Uh, one of my neighbors is a fashion designer. He's born and raised in Long Island. Um, he sends some of his models on the New York Fashion Week. He's got a fantastic store, great brand, Indian, but uh, manufactures all his textiles in India. 
and retails them in US. And he speaks perfect Punjabi and perfect Hindi. You wouldn't know he was born and raised here. So people to people connection can make such a huge impact. And just seeing it at this level, you can you know, bring it up to another level. The second thing that the prime minister said was, make sure you sort of uh, recommend Indian tourism places to at least five US families. That's another example, so, you know, we're getting Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry our time is up. <laughs> and I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Apologies can come to you. A round of applause to the panelists once Thank again. You. Thank you very much. Thanks.